Still loving that brand new intro. How you doing, everyone? My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and this is Scanner School, where we teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. Today is podcast episode 212, and I am actually practicing right now for a presentation that I would have given already What by the time you're listening to this, but it is coming up <laughs> as I am recording this. Uh, the magic of podcasting, right? And schedule things in. But today, I'm going to go through my slides, basically, on my presentation for Hamburg University, which is something that I normally do every single year. And it's been a little different with the pandemic going on last year. There wasn't enough room for me to be involved with it. But this year, they've actually brought back some more forums. And the scanning forum is one of those. And it's, it's a great place. You don't have to be into amateur radio or ham radio. It does ha- call the name ham radio university because it does have a lot of ham radio forums in it but there are other forums that are non-amateur related such as grounding and uh emergency communications and you know and power and those kinds of things and one of them being scanner radios in fact i've been doing this uh this forum for i don't know it's got to be a better part of a decade now in fact i even did a one or two on the NTS and national traffic system and even weather stations. That's, that's kind of, I think what got me there the first time around. So anyway, like I'm saying, I'm going to go through the uh, slides here and this is great for somebody right now who is coming into the scanner radio hobby. Maybe you just got a scanner for the first time over the holiday season. Maybe you're coming back into the hobby. So this falls also right in line with something that I like to do at the beginning of every single year. Kind of do a reset, right, on the class. And, you know, just take it back to square one, right? Get everybody up to speed in a quick podcast episode. Last year, we did it in three podcast episodes. Today, we're going to do it in one, again, so I can practice for my presentation coming up. So, again, this might be a refresher for you. Well, this might be something new for you. And again, if this is something that um, you find you need a little bit of extra help on, I am available for tutoring. You can just go to scannerschool.com slash tutoring, and we can sit down and do a one-on-one. Or if you just want to ask your questions for free, you can go to scannerschool.com slash ask. Now, before we get any further in this week's podcast, I want to take a few minutes to thank our Patreon supporters. Now, Patreon is an affordable way for you to support the podcast and our upcoming expansion into YouTube for 2022. So think of Patreon as the PBS model of helping out Scanner School. For a monthly or yearly donation, not only do you help support the podcast, but depending on your donation tier, you will receive certain benefits. The most popular benefit tier being our $5 a month, or the $51 a year tier. It's the same tier. We just discount if you can pay us over a year. Now, this tier offers the podcast and YouTube videos early. And also, you receive a free squelchy pack of stickers, several discounts, and access to our monthly live scanner radio roundtable discussion we hold monthly on Zoom. Oh, and by the way, most of the Patreon levels also get a special version of the podcast that does not include the middle advertising break in each episode. Now find out more about Patreon and our supporting tiers by visiting scannerschool.com slash Patreon. I'd also like to take a moment here and thank all of our Patreon supporters. Alan Gonzalez, Arthur Heron, Bill Kay, Brandon Sammons, Brian King, Buzz Gold, Chris Paris, Craig Harper, Dan, Dave Pasco, David C., Denny Crotty, Ed Walsh, Edward Bramlett, Glenn Wright, Greg Johnson, Guy Lee, Jack Kaycock, Jacob Jacobson, Jacques Berry, James Broxson, James Felling, James Peruda, Jay Reed, Jeff Block, Jeff Chapman, Jeff McLeod, Jenny Taylor, Jim B., Jim Heinrich, Joe Curtis, John Cordoff, John Keel, John Sweeney, John Goldenberg, Joshua Robb, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Kevin Zwicky, Lenny Bauer, Les Stevenson, Lynn Smith, Mark Beebe, Mason Craig. 
Kramer, Michael Gorman, Michael Kroger, Nicholas Stenger, Paul Teal, Paul Seish, Randy Cummins, Randy Lee Wright, Raymond Hill, Ronnie Box, Sal Marandola, Scott Lefgren, Terry Weatherford, Tim Mazet, Todd Glendi, and William R. Can. All right, so let's start off. <laughs> we'll do the dry run here. I got the timer going to see how long this is going to take me. But let's go through the uh, presentation here for Hammer University. So if you've already taken or been a part of HRU and you're taking uh, listening to this podcast as a refresher, then welcome back. Everybody else, buckle up. We'll see how we can get through this. So this is the Ham Radio University Scanner Radio Crash Course presented by yours truly, Phil Lichtenberger, W2LIE. So a little bit about me and how I got my start with the scanner radio hobby is I've been around scanning since um, well before I probably really knew what the scanner radio hobby was. My earliest memories growing up uh, is spending time at my grandparents' house and uh, watching their Bearcat, Electra Bearcat 101 with the L, like the lights going left to right in their kitchen. The sounds of police and fire calls would echo through the house and we'd be sitting in the living room watching TV and you know the kitchen was on the opposite side of the wall and we'd be able to hear that scanner going off all the time. So... Every time I tell this story, I, I really have that that picture in my head, right? I can see the countertop. I can see where the microwave oven was. I can see the shelves that they had set up in the kitchen. I can see exactly where that scanner used to sit. And uh, the, the Electra Bearcat 101 that I have in my collection, I don't know personally if it's my dad's or if it was my grandfather's or if it's just another one. I would love to believe it's my grandfather's scanner, but I really honestly don't know. But I'll tell myself it is to make me feel a bit better about the radio. But it's it's just something that I've always, always been around growing up as a kid. And also my father worked at Marine Shop right here on Long Island in Freeport. And anybody that was in the marine business or was actually in the scanner radio hobby might have gone down to Arex in Freeport on the Nautical Mile. And chances are good that my dad had helped them out with handing them crystals for their scanners. In fact, I still talk to some people that have uh, you know, been been around long enough that I actually remember my dad from being back in the day. So personally, it's it's kind of my dad passing the baton over to me to carry on what's been going on with scanning because for a long time, right, he was the, kind of the go-to guy. People come there and say, hey, you know, I want to listen to the local police department. What do I need or what should I buy or, or what crystals can you can you give me to, to listen to, you know, this, that, the other thing. So it's really cool to think about that, uh, you know, I'm, we're still continuing this part of the legacy, so to speak. So with all that, you know, my, my very first scanner radio was an old Fanon uh, Slim Scan. It was like a six or eight channel crystal scanner. It was a hand-me-down from my dad. And eventually, I went out and bought my own radio, a Uniden BC200 XLT, which I still have to this day. Again, probably one of the greatest handheld radios made during that time. And, you know, 200 channels, which was more than you could probably use at that time. Now, it's just a drop in the hat. But... Again, the times have changed, right? We're talking about a scanner from 1990-ish, 92 maybe. And yeah, it was it was a great time to get into the scanner at Radio Hobby back then. But enough about me. Let's go through what we're going to go through in today's presentation. So we're going to go with some basic scanner radio terms to bring anybody up to speed that hasn't been in the scanner radio hobby before or maybe a little bit uh, shy to ask what some of these definitions are. We'll go through conventional scanning, trunking scanning, some scanner radio hardware, and then we'll start wrapping things up with where to get more help and also some Q&A. So everybody who's listening here in the podcast, there won't be any Q&A on here, but again, I'm just reading from the slides so I get a little bit of practice going through everything. So let's go into the basics of the scanner radio hobby. What is scanning? Well, scanning is the ability to cycle through many frequencies per second. It's being able to monitor a single frequency or several different frequencies and allows you to monitor these several agencies on a single radio. And again, many scanner radios can scan rapidly and they can scan a large group of frequencies and they have alpha tagging and they have lockouts and they have programming, they're programmable on the fly, lots of accessories. It's a very exciting hobby to be in. Scanning, to summarize everything, scanning is fun and that's really what it needs to be. It's a fun and it's a hobby. And we all know hobbies 
can kind of drain your bank account a little bit, but <laughs> to scare you away. But if you let it get, if you if you let it go unchecked, yeah, that could ha- that could happen. So, why do we use a scanner radio and not a two way radio when it comes to the scanner radio ho- uh, hobby? So, scanners have a much much faster scan rate typically, and they also have much better memory management, which means that sometimes in a two way radio you don't have any banks. Sometimes you have hard set banks to 100. Sometimes you have to daisy chain banks together and you can't toggle banks on and off together unless they're daisy chained. So scanning is is a lot better with a scanner. It's, it's a lot more user, a lot more enjoyable, let's put it that way. You also have larger memories. You have better alpha tagging on uh, some scanner radios as well. Larger frequency ranges, right? Many two-way radios only cover, say, maybe VHF and UHF. Whereas a scanner radio would go from, say, 25 megahertz all the way up to the gigahertz range, all in one single receiver. Now, right, we all know trade-offs in that one is the, the more frequencies you're trying to receive in there, the less filtering you're going to have. So the better radio to have, if you can listen to, say, VHF, would be a VHF radio, no doubt, because it's tuned for that VHF spectrum. But if you need more flexibility, you're going to get it when it comes to a scanner radio. A scanner radio also, too, for the price point, has the ability to monitor complex systems in a single radio where you may pay more to have the ability to transmit on a two-way radio. You're not paying to be able to transmit on a scanner. You're paying for licensing in order to receive stuff like APCO P25 or regular Motorola Type 2 trunking, EDAX, LTR, uh, NXDN, DMR. Right, these are all things that we start taking for granted in the scanner radio hobby. Is the ability to start picking up all of these different kinds of modulation schemes that are out there. Scanners also have the ability to perform a little bit more complex functions, such as RF scope or searches, and also quicker decoding when it comes to PL, DPL, and NAC. Although that later bit is more or less pretty much neck and neck now with with modern technology in the two-way radio field so what can you listen to on a scanner radio now this is all something that will really be dictated by where exactly it is that you live like if you were to say hey phil you can listen to police on your scanner i'd say no i can't because it's encrypted right for the majority yes you can listen to the spectrum that is occupied by public safety which does include police fire Emergency management systems, uh, emergency medical uh, EMS, office of emergency management, transit. I mean, that includes railroads and buses and subways, ferry terminals, stuff like that, aviation and marine, tow companies, bus companies. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff, right, that's out there that you can listen to on a scanner radio. So let's go through some basic scanner radio terms. These are all terms that we have probably heard a thousand times maybe we do or we don't know or we don't understand what these terms all mean but we got to look at things in the simplest form here right as a refresher course everybody and let's talk about the basic thing that we all talk about is a hertz right what frequency are you toning to what is a frequency or what are hertz well in simplest form a frequency is the number or samples that something happens over a set period of time so, for example, if you were to take one step every second, in 60 seconds, you would have taken 60 steps. So your frequency would be one step per second or 60 steps per minute. That's your frequency. In RF, we talk about frequency in cycles per second. And more specifically, the unit of measurement is in hertz, spelled H-E-R-T-Z or H-E-R-T-Z for anybody who's outside of the United States and is named after the German physicist. So in our above example of one step per second, we could say that is one hertz. So 60 steps per minute, right, would be 60 hertz. So something to remember here too is that we can feel frequency in vibrations. The lower the frequency, the slower the vibration. And the higher the frequency the faster the vibration. So we can hear frequency with sound, right? You hear me speaking and my voice is in a certain frequency that you can hear and as being picked up by the microphone and being sent out by the speakers, your headset, right, et cetera, et cetera. So 
the lower the frequency again, the lower the sound, and the higher the frequency, the higher the sound. The same happens with RF or radio frequency, right? The lower the frequency, the slower the frequency, right? The the less number of cycles per second it has, and and so the higher the frequency is, the faster it cycles through, right? So the higher the frequency, the, the the shorter the frequency actually becomes as far as wavelengths goes. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. So when we talk about things as far as VHF, right? 146 megacycles per second is a longer wavelength than 800 megahertz or 800 mega, megacycles per second second. And that's how we talk about frequencies in our radio frequency environment. So we talk basically in about three different sizes when it comes to hertz in the scanner radio market. The first one being kilohertz, which is a thousand hertz, kilo, right? 1000 hertz. And typically we talk about kilohertz as far as step sizes go. Is it or bandwidth too. Is it a 6.25 kilohertz step? Is it a 12.5 kilohertz? Is it 25.0 kilohertz step size in our uh, in the band plan? Most time, our frequencies in the scanner radio world are in megahertz, and that's a million hertz per second, a million cycles per second. So 146 megahertz. Is 146 million hertz. What we don't talk about too often, though, is gigahertz. That's usually the top end of the bar and is really not much we listen to up there. ADSB, as far as airplanes go, satellite reception, th- those are all up in the gigahertz range of things. But as far as what we listen to on a daily basis on our scanners, we typically top off around 800, 900 megahertz. So, so that's really the, the top end of the spectrum here. So, what are some different kinds of conventional? transmission types that we commonly talk about well first one would be simplex that is when two radios use the same frequency they both transmit and receive on the same frequency simplex a good use of simplex would be fire ground communications point to point tactical channels right right where you don't need anything in the middle to get the point across radio to radio is simplex. The next one is duplex. This one's a little bit confusing. This is when radio A transmits to radio B, but radio B transmits back to radio A on a completely different frequency. So radio A's transmitter is actually radio B's receiver. Radio B's transmit is actually radio A's receive. In theory, right, this is almost identical to how your phone works, where you can talk to somebody and hear them at the same time. In a duplex system, that could be possible, okay? Another way of thinking about a duplex system would be really that somebody is transmitting on the output of the repeater and you are transmitting on the input of the repeater. Sometimes we think about as repeaters as only being the same input and with a single output, but sometimes duplex is in place, such as an area where the dispatcher doesn't need to transmit to the transmitter. They may have a hard line that goes right to the output port on the repeater. In reality, they are listening to you, right, direct through duplex. But then let's talk about repeaters again. This is when your tower top transmitter or your building top or your mountain top transmitter receives everybody on receive frequency and then retransmits that out to a different frequency that everybody else receives on. The point of having a repeater over simplex and duplex is the fact that repeaters are at a central high point. And what that basically means is that you got a larger footprint now on where you can use your radios because the repeater is could potentially be between you and the other person. Think of being between a mountain range, right? Well, if the repeater is in the top of the mountain, then you could basically talk over the mountain because the repeater is repeating your signal on the other side for you. So that's a really quick basic rundown of different types of transmitter types or transmit types. So let's talk about analog transmissions. We really only talk about two different kinds of transmissions in analog mode. We have AM and FM. 
In other words, these are transmissions that we can hear without any type of digital converter in the play. In a real world, right, your voice, my voice right now, speaking to you directly, not through a podcast or anything else, right? If you were sitting across the room from me, you would hear me in analog. You're hearing me right now in analog because we go from analog to digital, digital back to analog again. That's that's getting complicated as far as going back into a digital transmission. True analog transmissions, right, is is basically your voice being transmitted over as a frequency coming back over through something you can listen to. We have two different kinds, again, we of, of analog transmissions, one being amplitude modulation, or AM, which consists of a carrier wave and also a uh, modulation waveform, which is an AC signal inside of the carrier wave. Look, there's a lot of stuff that goes into AM modulation here. I'm not here to go through and break down exactly how AM works. We don't have time to sit through that on this uh, on this training. But what you really need to know about AM modulation is the fact that multiple transmissions can be heard at the same time. It can be demodulated using a very simple circuit with very few electrical components, making it very cheap and simple to build. And AM signals can be reflected back to Earth from the ionosphere layer. It allows the signals to propagate several thousand miles away, which is why it's used for short wave transmissions and also used for aviation. Because if two planes are transmitting on top of each other, you can really hear both of them at the same time. AM is very simple, again, and it's very, very widely used. It's pretty much the only thing being used in the aviation spectrum. So if you want to get an AM or if you want to get the aviation, AM is what you'd be listening to. Now, the cons of AM are is very inefficient when it comes to power because two-thirds of it is lost just in the carrier wave. The receiver can detect a lot of noise and interference rather easily, such as from transformers or thunderstorms and electrical motors. And it's not really effective at all when it comes to bandwidth. But it's still used primarily with citizens band radio, AM broadcasts or talk radio and sports radio, and aviation. Okay? Big stuff when it comes to there. FM, on the other hand, is a lot cleaner, right? When you listen to FM radio, you definitely know you're listening to FM as opposed to AM. And the RF carrier frequency is varied based on the modulation symbol. So it's also much more spectrum efficient. The pros are is that the information changes in frequency, not in amplitude. And it covers the frequency ranges that humans can hear. So it sounds more natural to us. Some of the cons of FM are the fact that higher FM frequencies is absorbed by the ionosphere and does not get reflected back to Earth. So it's lost once it kind of goes out from the curvature of the Earth, right? FM radio is used by commercial FM, broadcast radio, and FM radio communications. In FM radio communications, we have FM and FM for narrow FM. The new narrow FM being super narrow FM, basically. Again, regular FM would have started at 25 kilohertz wide. Then it went down to 12 and a half. Now it's down to 6.25. So yeah, FM is pretty flexible when it comes to something like that as well. While we're talking about analog transmissions, let's talk about filtering analog transmissions. And by that, we talk about PL and DPL codes, sometimes called CTCSS or, or uh, DCS codes. Now, we use these to filter noise or other stations that might be sharing the same frequency that we are on. Okay. PL is Motorola's trademark name for a Motorola private line, and DPL, the same thing, is digital private line. PL and CTCSS are sub audible analog tones transmitted with a carrier. Receivers will only open squelch for radios that are transmitting that same PL code. It's a lock and key kind of system, right? That's what these all are here. Digital coded squelch, pretty much the same thing in principle, except it's using a digital a digital signal that is sent with the analog carrier. And receivers will only open up when the correct digital code is received. Now, how does it know when the digital code starts and ends? Because there's a preamble, which allows both receivers or receiver and transmitter to sync up together so that the receiver knows what code the actual transmitter is transmitting out. There's a lot more DPL codes available over PL codes. So sometimes we'll find 
DPL codes in use. It really doesn't matter which one you use, it's just whatever one works best for your situation and your scenario. All right, let's move on to digital transmissions. And this is where everybody starts to go, oh, great, here we go. Look, don't let digital get you down. Don't let digital make you feel like you don't understand what's going on here. Okay, it's not that much difficult to understand if you understand analog. Okay, think of it as being transparent to you. It's just something new. Okay, the scanner is going to take care of everything it needs to do in order to allow you to receive that digital transmission. There are several different kinds of digital transmissions that we need to be concerned with, and each one has its own protocol. When it comes to digital, it's an all or nothing type of transmission when you're receiving it. In other words, when you have analog, you can kind of hear things through the static if you don't have a great transmission. When digital comes into play, you get to a certain point where the signal is unrecoverable. There's too much error, and the signal just is gone. I don't know where that noise came from, but that's what's happening here. So we need to make sure, though, that we're all talking in the same protocol. So it's P25, NXDN, DMR. Uh, was it PDMR, I think it is, over state, or DPMR over in Europe? You got Tetra, MPT, something or other. It is, there's a whole pile of digital transmissions, and that's not even included in the amateur radio transmissions, such as Yesu Fusion or, this, uh, or D-Star. I'm sure there's other ones that are out there that are in use, but those are two that come to mind really quick that are specific to just amateur radio. Amateur radio also uses DMR and P25 and NXDN as well. So if you're used to using that in amateur radio, then it's the same here on your scanner. But we need to remember that there's two different kinds of modulation that we are looking at. Not really modulation, but timing that we have to worry about when it comes to digital. And these are not interchangeable for the most part. You have FDMA, which stands for Frequency Division Multiple Access. And then you have TDMA, which stands for Time Division Multiple Access. What's the difference? Well, FDMA basically means that you are owning the entire carrier for the entire time you're talking about it, talking on it. So, for example, think of FDMA as being analog for the most part, because when an analog station keys up on the air, they have that frequency tied up for their resource at that time. Nobody's sharing it, right? It's only you using it until you drop your carrier and somebody else can come on. The same way is what FDMA uses, okay? With TDMA, or time division multiple access, what happens is over a course of microseconds, faster than you can hear, that frequency is split over time. It's my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, turn to transmit on that carrier. We are not transmitting at the exact same time, and the receiver knows based on timing sequences when it should be receiving the signal it needs to put back together again. So effectively now, you can take a single frequency and put two people on it using TDMA. It's a much better form of frequency resources. You can double up effectively the number of users, the number of talk groups, the number of people that are using the frequency at one time. So let's look at different kinds of digital technology out there. We've got P25, which is the one that a lot of people start off with because that is the one that's most often used by public safety. It is a Project 25 or P25 set of standards that are produced through the joint efforts of the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials International, which is where we get the acronym APCO from. APCO 25 or P25 or Project 25 uses NAC codes for their filtering. It is the P25 equivalent of a PL or a DPL code. NAC codes are three-digit hexadecimal decimal numbers, and there's over 4,096 possible NAC available for programming. So what do we need to do in order to program in, say, P25 conventional in our scanner? We just really need to know what the frequency is. That's it. No different than popping in an analog channel. If we know the NAC code, good, we can go ahead and put it in there. Now, there might be some talk groups involved, but the scanner will pass every talk group that comes in on that frequency if we program it in as conventional. Talk groups, again, could be used as filters. 
For anybody that's in the amateur radio world that uses P25, this should come as nothing new to you. The same is true for DMR. DMR is a digital mobile radio, and it's uh, the DMR Association was established in 2005 and is made up of 40 members, including JVC, Kenwood, ICOM, Motorola, and Hytera, just to name a few. Now, according to the DMR Association, the key benefits of DMR are the fact that it is doubling the capacity of existing networks. Why? Because DMR is strictly TDMA. It is backwards spectrum compatibility with legacy systems, basically meaning you can use your old licenses or your old frequencies on DMR. It's, it's, it's one of these things that says, hey, you could go ahead and use our system on your old frequencies if you want to. They claim to have longer battery life because when you key up, the radio is not keying up all the time because it is cycling off and on due to the TDMA talk groups. I call shenanigans on that, but that's all up to you. There are extra advanced control features built into DMR, such as GPS coordinates or short messaging and stuff like that. And of course, there are security standards that can be applied because it is digital. DMR is true digital, just like Abco P25, which means there is no analog whatsoever on that system. And just like P25, DMR uses the AMBE plus two vocoder developed by DVSI, which is why when you buy your digital scanner, you're paying a little bit more for it because you have to pay for the licensing to DVSI. So if you're going to program in DMR conventional into your scanner, what do you need to know? The frequency. That's it. At a bare minimum, just got to pop the frequency and tell it's DMR if you have DMR enabled on your scanner. Optionally, you can add color codes which is the equivalent of NAC, which is the equivalent of PL and DPL. You can add a talk group because every single DMR transmission has a talk group that's tied, tied to it. Again, that acts as your filter. And then optionally, you can add a time slot because again, we have TDMA here. We have slot one and slot two. If you don't program in a, a slot into your scanner, the scanner is going to pick whatever time slot comes up on that frequency. It's pretty simple. Don't let it confuse you. NXDN, just think of it as rinse, wash, and repeat, basically. It's another protocol. This one was developed or created in 2003 and was announced to the public in 2005 with the first radios appearing in 2006. Now, this one was made primarily for the business environment. It is meant to upgrade existing analog LTR systems into a digital world, and it uses FDMA. NXDN stands for the next generation of digital narrow band. NXDN can support 6.25 kilohertz step uh, spacing or 12.5. Kenwood's NXDN solution is called NextEdge. ICOM's NXDN solution is called IDAS or ICOM Digital Advanced System. And just like DMR, NXDN has an NXDN forum and it has 30 members including radio manufacturers such as again JVC Kenwood and ICOM. And even radio test sets from Aeroflix and Ritsu, General Dynamic, and other dispatch consoles as well. Instead of using color codes, it uses RAND codes, radio access codes. So what we need to know to program in a conventional NXDN into our scanner, same as everything else, just the frequency. If we have a RAND code, if we have a talk group ID, plop them in. Not required, just to get you up and running. But... What really does matter, though, is when we jump into trunking. So what is trunking? Well, we're going to answer that question right after this quick break. Now, if anybody is a Patreon supporter at the $3 or more per month level, you won't get this break. So if you want to help support the podcast, you can go to scannerschool.com slash Patreon and become a Patreon member today. Hey, did you realize it takes us almost $100 a week just to have this podcast episode professionally edited and sent over to you? This doesn't even include website and podcast hosting, administrative help, and other monthly subscriptions that are required to put the podcast out there. Now, you can help us offset these costs when you shop online. So if you're looking for a scanner radio or some software, looking to bid on items over on eBay, or if you're looking to purchase anything, and I mean anything, on Amazon, you can help support Scanner School in the process and this doesn't come at any extra cost to you. So please check out scannerschool.com slash support for the multiple different ways that we have out there that you can help support us when you shop online. Again, scannerschool.com slash support. 
Are you looking to learn more about the scanner radio hobby? We currently have courses on how to get started and up and running with software-defined radios and how to turn your SDR into a fully functioning scanner radio. With free software, you can see more and do more with trunking than ever before. And with new courses scheduled for the upcoming months, our offerings will be expanding into both Uniden and Whistler hardware and software. Check out our courses at courses.scannerschool.com or by looking for the link in this podcast description. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues, too. Visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issue and sign up today. Did you know that a pager can make a great addition to your scanner radio collection. And even if I didn't own East Coast pagers, I still have one or maybe a couple of pagers as a part of my scanner radio setup. This is because a pager can be used to just monitor your local fire department or your regional departments. And if you set it up correctly to alert you when the tones are sent over the air, then the pager will remain silent until you need to know what is going on. This frees up your scanner to monitor everything else that's going on beside your local stuff or can prevent you from missing the local stuff because your scanner is busy doing other things. Now, pagers aren't just limited to fire dispatches anymore. Unication has great solutions to monitor both analog and P25 paging systems where many public safety and police departments are switching over to. Swiss Home and Apollo make great analog solutions as well, and all three still sell Pogsac and Flex pagers, still in use by many departments for text alerting. East Coast Pagers is an Apollo, Swiss Home, and Unication dealer serving the North American market, and of course is one of my online companies. So if you're looking for a personal use pager or one for your department, contact us for a free quote and let us know you're a Scanner School listener for something a little extra with your order. For all full inventory or request a quote or just to contact us, please visit eastcoastpagers.com. All right, so what is trunking and how does it work? So this one is one of these things that's it's it's a little interesting to try and say what it is over the air. I like using my hands when I speak about what trunking is. But let's look at trunking this way. Let's look at trunking as there's a full orchestra in front of us and we have separate sections of the orchestra. In the front of the orchestra, we have the conductor. And think of the conductor as being the control channel. And then we've got the percussionists. And we've got the violins, the cellos, right? We've got the brass section. We've got the trumpets, the clarinets, the wood wood sections, right? The woodwind sections. The entire orchestra is made up of all these users. These are the radios in the network. And then all these little groups and all these radios make up the groups. Every single clarinet player makes up the clarinet section. And every single trumpet player makes up the trumpet section. But the French horns and the trumpets and the tubas all make up the brass section, right? So what happens when it's time for the violins to speak up? And, and be front and center. Well, the conductor makes sure that he has all their attention and he tells the violins, now it's your time and your turn to solo. And then it's time for the brass section to come in, right? The trumpets need to respond back and the conductor looks over at the trumpets and says, raises his hands up in the air to get more vib- vibrato out of them, right? Or volume or whatever it is so that the trumpets can be heard over the rest of the orchestra. This is like a trunk system here. Okay, this is this is the best way I've ever figured out in my mind to kind of paint a picture that everybody can understand in their head and they can figure out how a trunk system works. So what ends up happening is you've got all these people that are divided up into groups and you've got a conductor telling everybody when it's their turn to have center stage. So the next level of this is basically, let's think about it as in frequency-wise goes. And I'm just going to say we have frequency one, two, three, four, and five. Well, when it's time for the woodwinds to kick in, well, let's just break it down. When it's time for the violins, they go to frequency one. And the trumpets go to frequency two. And the percussionists go to frequency three. But the French horns, they don't have anything to play right now. So they're silent. 
They're, they're not occupying any space or any frequency. They're just sitting idle. You don't hear them. As soon as the violins are done, they come back and they wait for the conductor to tell them where to go next. And they're no longer on frequency one. And because no longer on frequency one, the drums, the tippany section, right? The, 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 the dong, 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 right? <laughs> they're coming in. They go back to, they go to frequency one because it's an empty frequency and they can use it because the violins have vacated that resource. And then you've got the lonely triangle and the triangle, is, it's his turn. He goes to frequency five. So all the while, we have this conductor telling people where to go. We're telling groups where to be. And he's moving them as he moves his baton around through different frequencies at different times. And at no one point does more than one group occupy a single frequency unless they're patched and working together as a full section, such as the Woodwood section might be all patched together. And all of their groups happen to show up in the same frequency at the same time because the conductor said, all you guys are going to work together now. You guys all go together on frequency four. And the brass will all go together on frequency two. And the lonely triangles all by himself, ding, on frequency three. This all happens magically thanks to the control channel. The control channel has a lot more going on, such as radio affiliations and denials and private conversations when one person A has told person B and even data goes through the control channel. There's a lot happening on that control channel. That's why it's very important for every radio to understand what the control channel is telling them to do at that particular time. Everything comes over the control channel. It's a nice little dance or a ballet, right? Of what's going on here. And that's all it is. That's all trunking is. Trunking is a great way. It's an awesome way to use limited resources to its maximum ability. Because think about it. If any town USA owns a dispatch frequency, it's only owned for them and they only they can use it. And when they only use it for five minutes a day, it's still theirs to use forever and ever. And nobody else can use it because it's licensed to them. But when you are on a trunk system and you're not using that resource, somebody else can use it. So you can have 100 talk groups on a system only using a handful of frequencies instead of 100 frequencies. Trunking is efficient. And your scanner pretty much handles it for you. So let's talk about some common analog trunk systems that are in play still today. We have Motorola Type 2, which should not be confused with Motorola P2 or Phase 2. Different animals. Motorola Type 2 is a APCO 16 system. It's all analog. If there are digital talk groups on it, it's a hybrid system, and those can be used with, an, with a P25 scanner. There may be some special program when it comes to a Type 2 system, such as rebanding or custom tables. But for the most part, your scanner handles it all. EDAC stands for Enhanced Digital Access Communication System. And just like Motorola Type 2, it's an analog-based system. And these are dinosaurs at this point. They are going extinct, which is why I'm not spending a lot of time talking about them right now. Following with that is LTR, a logical trunk radio. Logical trunk radio is mostly a commercial-based radio system. For both EDAX and LTR, you need to understand logical channel numbering, and you need to tell the scanner what frequency is in channel 1, what frequency is in channel 2, what frequency is in channel 3. Okay, With Motorola, you don't have to do that. Motorola, it's hard-coded. Digital trunking, we have Motorola P25. Motorola P25 Phase 1 is FDMA. Motorola Phase 2, though, is TDMA. So when you have two voice channels per frequency. DMR, you have several different flavors of DMR trunking. You have Capacity Plus, Connect Plus, Capacity Max, and Tier 3. Again, your scanner knows how to handle all of these systems just by programming them in. NXDN. There's two flavors when it comes to trunking on NXDN. There's Type C, which has got a dedicated control channel, which is the Kenwood standard of Next Edge. And there's Type D, where there's no dedicated channel. You have a single or multi-channel setup. That's FDMA only. And all channels can be a voice channel. That kind of aligns up with LTR. So before we wrap up, there is something else we need to touch on, and that is simulcast. This is the big one. So simulcast is something that is a big problem when it comes to P25, even worse problem when it comes to P25 Phase 2. And the best way I can describe simulcast is back in the days when we had analog TV and we had ghosting on our analog transmitters or analog TV sets. That would be when you're watching a football game, you can kind of see a secondary football game of the same football game superimposed just slightly out of sync. 
Or you'd be watching the nightly news and you'd see the anchor desk man person. We've got to be politically correct here. But the anchor desk person would be superimposed on themselves just slightly out of sync. Think of that as simulcast distortion. While an analog station can be put back together. Your eyes know which is the one you should be watching. But when it comes to digital, that's a problem. And it's a problem because your scanner needs to know where the zeros and ones should be. If the zeros and ones aren't showing up where the zeros and ones belong, your scanner cannot put the transmission back together again. There are several ways to work around simulcast. The, the easiest one is to buy a radio that works with simulcast. And right now, the only two radios on the market that are manufactured for simulcast are the Uniden SDS-100 and the SDS-200. Those are about $650 radios. Your other options are to eliminate the simulcast and only set your station up so that it receives only one transmitter site. If you can eliminate the second or third signal coming in, you might have a better time at listening to these simulcast stations. So you're getting into the scanner radio hobby. I know we kind of rushed things out through the end here because I'm very conscious about what the time is. I'm leaving room in the end for questions and answers. So might be cutting a little bit shorter when it comes to the actual presentation here. But where can you go for more help? Well, radio reference is probably the first place you should go if you're getting into the scanner radio hobby. It's full of forms, a wiki, a database, and they have over 1 million registered users. Another place you can go is Facebook. There's tons and tons and tons of groups for this scanner radio hobby located over on Facebook. If you're looking for a group to join, just put the keywords in. I'm sure you will find something. Additionally, you can check out the scanner guys over on YouTube. They have a show every week on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. on YouTube. And every week is a new topic. And it's a new show. And it's, it's a long show. But it's a great entertaining show. But finally, you can come to what I have, which is Scanner School. It's a podcast. We have over 210 podcast episodes released to date. With new podcast episodes releasing every single Tuesday. You can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast player, on our website, and over on our YouTube channel. We also host live Q&A sessions on the first Tuesday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel. And our podcast episodes on the first Tuesday are also dedicated to answering your questions. You can submit questions via email on our website via SpeakPipe. Again, information for this is over on our website or by dialing 516-308-2885 and leaving us a voicemail. We also have a Discord server set up too for anybody who has Discord that wants to join a live community there as well. So in the presentation, this is where I would leave time for questions and answers, looking at the clock that is counting right now. It looks like I definitely need to speed things up because it's only a 50-minute session and I'm about at the 46-minute mark right now. So I'm not really leaving much room in my presentation right now in this practice run for questions and answers. So I'll have to go back and listen to this and figure out where I can cut things off because I'm sure there'll be questions in the middle of this. The problem is, is there's so much information in here to knock it into a you know, a 50-minute forum with some room for questions and answers at the end of it. It's tough, right? We know last year I went through this podcast episode in three different podcasts. So to sandwich it in to a single podcast episode is tough, or a single 50-minute session is tough, which is why we're here, and we're always asking for your questions, okay? Breaking things down into smaller podcast sessions that we can kind of talk a little more slower at and spend more time on is something that is what the podcast was created in mind. So I can't answer your questions right now because I can't hear you. <laughs> it's the nature of the beast of the podcast. But listen, I want to answer your questions. It helps me create more podcast episodes. It actually will help me create content for our YouTube channel, which will be growing this year as well. So please go to scannerschool.com slash ask and leave me a question or a suggestion for any podcast episodes or YouTube episodes that you would love to see. Go to our website, fill out the form, click on the SpeakPipe link, or dial 516-308-2885 and leave me a message. So my last ask is that you share the podcast episode with somebody you think would benefit from learning or that needs a crash course with the scanner radio hobby. My 
reason for creating Scanner School was to help as many people as possible with the hobby, and I can't do that without your help. So please, for this podcast episode, share the YouTube channel or whatever it is that you found the podcast with somebody that you know. All right. Until next week, guys, I want to say thanks for listening. Hopefully, you guys got something out of this. Maybe it was a review for you. Maybe you learned something new. But let me know. Leave me some feedback in the description below. And we will catch you all next week. 7331, my name again is Phil Lichtenberger, and my amateur radio call sign is W2LIE. And this is Scanner School. We teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. 73.